Well, I'm honored to be here at this distinguished lecture series. Uh, my goal is not to be an extinguished lecturer, so we'll uh, work toward that. But seriously, my real goal is to create an awareness and encourage dialogue about technology's role in our social worlds, um, our communication with each other, our families, our relationships with other people, in business and school and healthcare. I'm going to try to touch on all these a little bit. Uh, just to kind of introduce this, I don't know if you've noticed, but technology and technology use has become a hot topic. And uh, so I'm just going to show you some examples, some from our own daily career, like this one just came out last week. Um, are women more addicted to smartphones than men? Interviewed six of our students, three of them who were my former students, and talks about, about uh, gender and addictions. Here's one from um, this fall. Can smartphones make you dumb? The short answer is yes. We'll talk more about that. This one came out a couple weeks ago. Arizona Republic. Screen addiction is just destroying travel. How people who go on vacations are glued to their phones and they aren't really experiencing the environment that they're in. Um, the Atlantic had an article a little while ago that was extremely intriguing to me. And the title is, Has the Smartphone Destroyed a Generation? Very insightful article. Uh, one of my colleagues gave me this one. Are smartphones really destroying the adolescent brain? <coughs> We're going to talk a little bit, bit about brain research today. And then finally, this just came out last week in the uh, Arizona Republic, addicted to your smartphone, how to kick it. So this is something that we're noticing in our society. So my caveat, I am not a dinosaur. I know that my looks may betray that, but I'm really not a dinosaur. I am not anti-technology at all. In fact, when I was preparing for this, I just thought I'd do this little thought experiment. So I sat down for 30 seconds and said, how do I use technology? And I came up with 15 things in 30 seconds on how I use technology from emails to the internet to paying my bills, you know? So I, this is not a rant against technology, but it is a talk about mindfulness about technology. So in a lot of ways, digital technology has made our lives more convenient and simpler in some ways. But we'll, if we really think about it, it's also complicated our lives. Um, Jenny Bilbray, who introduced me, was talking about a person who came in uh, this week to, get, to apply for a job at Home Depot as a laborer to load trucks. All the applications were online everything and he walked away frustrated he says all I want to do is load trucks and so it has complicated our lives um, the expectation of multitasking and we're going to talk a little bit more about that I've been on interviews here at the school where they said where they extolled multitasking and said well tell us a time where you've successfully multitasked and uh, I'm going to try to destroy that myth here today uh, and what that's done is it's resulted in a technology which we're, we're kind of an ADD society. We have to be stimulated. We have to do more than one thing at a time. Another thing, and my students tell me this, is this 24-7 um, demand or availability. Okay, so I have students who are, who are waiters in restaurants, the servers in restaurants. Um, they're doing other jobs and they say, our employer makes us have cell phones. And it, they used to have schedules, and if you weren't on the schedule, you didn't have to show up, right? Mm -hmm. Now they want all of us to be available 24-7, and if they want to change the schedule, they call us up and say, you, you better be available, you better come in. So there's this expectation, the expectation of answering texts. Uh, technology has made a vast amount of information about our private lives available to the public sector. Some of it which we really aren't aware of. You know, when you sign up for Google or Microsoft or any of the servers, you sign this little term of agreement, right? You've all seen that? Have you all read the fine print? 
Yeah. Really nobody. That fine print says we can take anything you do on the computer and we can sell it to anybody we want. Huh. And they sell it to huge companies like Axiom. And that's why when you've just looked at a newspaper article, then the next thing you know, a website pops up and for an ad on a product that's related to what you just read. In fact, in London, they now have a billboard, several billboards that have cameras on them. And as you walk by, facial recognition will scan your face, put it through software, and then the billboard will change to the product that they think you're most likely to buy instantly. Oh my. Okay, that's the kind of information that's out there available to the public because of technology. Uh, we've exposed our children to information that we as adults are almost powerless to control, to monitor. Uh, technology companies have become huge power brokers, not just in economics, but also in politics. And uh, they're one of the driving forces in healthcare, uh, in every area of our collective lives. And the laws regulating tech companies are pretty loose. And those companies would love to believe that everything they do, all their inventions, really benefit us and make our lives better. Okay? But as a sociologist and an observer of human nature, I'm really interested in what technology is doing to us as well as what it's doing for us. Uh, for the last 30 years, I've observed students. I've been teaching for about 32 years now, full time in the college setting. And I've seen our students change drastically. But that biggest change has been in the last 10 years. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So, how is technology changing who we are as human beings? That's the question I want to address. And ask, is that a good thing? So, I know this is going to sound to some people like a list of evils about technology. That's not my intent. I'm not here to bash everything technology does. But I do want us to be more self-conscious of it. So, in 2013, Pew Research made this statement. The cell phone is the most quickly adopted consumer technology in the history of the world. So, here's the quiz, and I always give a quiz in my classes. When was the, did the first smartphone appear? 2002. Okay, so hold off and I'll get you that answer, all right? So, this month, Pew Research updated their study. They said the vast majority of Americans, 95%, now own a cell phone of some kind. The share of Americans that own smartphones is now 77%, up just 35% in Pew Research first survey of smartphone ownership conducted in 2011. For those of you that are around young people like I am, 100% of 18 to 29 year olds own cell phones. 94% own smartphones, which is basically everybody. So let's look at the automobile. And we, we now use the term technology to refer to mobile technology, digital technology, smartphones, computers. But technology in its broadest sense means any tool that we use to make our lives better. So let's look at the automobile. First automobile, 1885. Carl Benz, first gasoline powered automobile. Okay? That's 1885, keep that date in mind. Anybody know when the interstate highway system was completed? 1962. 1992. Glenwood, Colorado was the last section of interstate there through the Rocky Mountains. So, it took us 107 years to figure out the automobile. And I don't know if you've seen the old films about the automobile, but people are running into trees and they're running into each other. There's no stop signs, no stop lights. Heavens, no seat belts, no turn signals, nothing like that, okay? No roads, basically, there are wagon trails. And so it took us over a century to figure out how to make the automobile safe. I remember when there were no seat belts, no airbags, okay? All that, that's been within our lifetimes even, okay? So, the first smartphone, the Blackberry, came out in 2002. 
the iPhone didn't appear on the scene until 2007, just a decade ago. Now 100% of 18 to 29 year olds own smartphones and 94% and or cell phones, 94% own smartphones. That's how quickly the technology scene has, has changed. So if it took us over a century to figure out the rules for the automobile, how long is it going to take for us to figure out rules about this new technology? Because right now, there are no rules. Your, your smartphones come with an owner's manual, but they don't tell you how, when, where, what the socially approved ways of using that are. Uh, so, no rules. We have a lot of assumptions about technology, though. One of our assumptions of my students is, and I heard this this semester, well, the old people, they don't use technology. Okay, the young people are on technology all the time, but the old people, they don't use technology. Um, during, between 2013 and 2015, I surveyed 636 Yellow Fi College students, an extensive research project I did, which the college allowed me to do with a sabbatical as well. And um, I found that there was very little difference about the time people were on technology based on age. It was about four minutes a year was the difference. So the, the age, everybody's using it. Older people, younger people, that's an assumption, a misassumption that we have. But the way that the generations use technology is very different, I found. So um, Mark Prinsky, who is a video game developer, came out with an idea called digital natives and digital immigrants. Has anybody ever heard that terminology before? Okay, digital natives are those people who have grown up with technology, okay? My grandkids, my kids, we'll talk about my kids in a minute, but <coughs> my grandkids, most of our students in the traditional student age range, they've never known what, is not, what it's been not to be connected to the internet, okay? So they would be digital natives. The rest of us who didn't grow up with digital technology would be digital immigrants, okay? Uh, my first computer science course was in 1971 at the University of California, Irvine. And we programmed by using teletype machines and punch tape. Okay, we rolled the punch tape up and took it to the computer office and 24 hours later we could come back, see if we made a mistake. And if we made one mistake, we had to do it all over again because it didn't come out right, okay? My first uh, uh, exposure to laptop, I was in Indo Indonesia at the time and one of our pilots brought over a um, laptop uh, Apple and uh, I found out that I could use the same stuff that I used at UC Irvine 15 years earlier to program this Apple laptop okay but but it's changed but Mark Prinsky he came with his idea of digital natives and digital immigrants and his purpose in that was to say hey your kids know more about technology than you do so if they say they need this computer technology, you better go out and buy it for them because they're smart and you're stupid. Okay? It was a great marketing ploy because when technology was first introduced, parents were like, I don't know what that, I need this, I need this. Uh, my, my youngest daughter, when she was in kindergarten, was um, part of a program by IBM at the school called Write to Read. And it was to get kindergartners to write stories even though they couldn't spell or anything like that, but they were on the computers, okay? And they had computers in their classrooms. IBM and uh, Microsoft gave those computers to the schools. An outstanding marketing ploy, because the students came home and said, kindergartners come home and say, I need a computer, mom and dad. Okay, it wasn't out of the generosity of the hearts that IBM and Microsoft donated this. It, it was to get us hooked on those computers. And so there was this big divide, he said, between digital natives and digital immigrants. Well, as a result, result of my research, I found that that wasn't quite true. There are differences in generations, but it's not about what they know about computers or how much they use computers. It's about how they use computers. And so I've called, called these three generations analogs, um, 
digitals and internets. Okay, so many of you here in this room today are analogs. You know, we know what an analog is. My watch is analog. It has the minute and second hand, okay, before the digitals. And uh, when I was in typing class in high school, if you were the fastest typist, you got to use the one electric typewriter <laughs> that we had in the room. Okay, so that was the big reward. So, so we didn't, it, any of you learned to tell time on the Judy clock? Remember the Judy clock that had the big hands on it tell the time? You know, that's the world that we grew up in when we were in school. Okay, and as computers have come up, we have learned them as they've come up. We've adapted to that. Um, and what I find my students forget is that who is designing the technology that they're using that they don't think the old folks know? It's the analogs. They're the ones that have designed the actual computers and the software that we're using, okay? So that's us, our old, us oldie moldies, you know, that we've adapted to technology. Um, I wouldn't see pictures of my grandkids if I wasn't on Facebook. <laughs> Okay, so we've done that. Then there's the digitals. And these are like my kids. The internet was just coming to age when my kids were in high school. And so AOL, I don't know if any of you remember America Online. Okay, so that was the, the, the format, the platform. And uh, so my kids started experimenting with that, started talking to people online. Actually, my oldest daughter kind of snuck out and met somebody she met online, and I didn't know this until afterwards, about had a heart attack. But um, so they grew up with, with it as basically communication. So us analogs, we see technology as tools. Okay, this is how we're gonna do our taxes, this is how we're gonna see the pictures. We see it as productivity tools, okay? Digitals, like my children, see pr technology primarily as a communication tool. Okay, it's primarily about ed education, or um, communication. The internets, which are traditional 18 to 29 year olds, see technology very different. If you ask them what they use, they will say, I use Snapchat, I use Instagram, Facebook, uh, Reddit, some of these other applications. And Netflix, it's not unusual to go in the cafeteria and see people on their phones watching movies or TV shows on their, on their phones. So, so that the internets see technology primarily as entertainment. Mm -hmm. Primarily as entertainment. And so there, it's not about the, the time that people use the technology. It's about how we use technology. And that, that's at least what my roots are sure. So the promise of technology was that with all this stuff, it's going to level the world. Thomas Friedman wrote a very famous book called The World is Flat. And he talked about how technology was going to level the economic global playing field. It is not. Okay. Um, people in social media says it's going to break down barriers. It's going to break down racial barriers, social economic barriers, class barriers, okay, age barriers. It is not. In fact, Dana Boyd in a book called It's Complicated which is about the lives of teenagers and the internet, found that, that social media actually uh, solidifies groups rather than bringing them back together. In fact, people, different groups actually use different platforms to communicate with each other. So uh, most concerning to me, though, is the way that technology changes our interactions with one another. I'm sure you can all think about a thousand examples. So there seems to be a disconnect between our social or our real worlds and our virtual worlds. 65% of the students I surveyed said that they prefer to communicate in person rather than on text or internet or anything like that. However, most of their communication is over technology. So why this disconnect? Well, it seems like what technology does is it gives us this illusion of safety. So if I'm behind my phone screen or I'm behind the, my computer screen, then I can say pretty much anything I want without impunity. 
every semester I see emails from faculty or to faculty from students that I call the flaming emails okay that are just I mean some of them have swear words in them some of them are just you know why did you give me this grade blah 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 and it's like whoa because you're on the other side of the screen it doesn't matter how I talk to you and so so there there's this illusion that that the screen be using technology then gives us some kind of social safety and allows us to throw out the rules of common decency and etiquette. So it may, and the reason, one of the other reasons I found in talking to students is that they say it's really easy, easier to have those difficult conversations with other people over technology than have them face to face. And there's some implications to that as well. So, uh, it's interesting because the research that has been done says that the more a person is online, the less willing they are to take risk in the real world. So there's kind of a cocooning effect that happens. Um, Sherry Turkle of MIT, she is the professor of sociology and or, or technology and culture, and she's wrote several books that I'll, I'll refer to later. But um, she writes this in a book called Alone Together, which I would highly recommend. It says, once we remove ourselves from the flow of physical, messy, untidy life, we become less willing to get out there and take a chance. And so I'm seeing a whole generation of students who are less willing to go into professors' offices and talk, or much, willing, or much less willing to have those difficult conversations with even their peers, because they can do it easier over technology. And then there's the expectation of multitasking. And uh, excuse me if I get on my soapbox on this one. But um, here, here's something. Research conducted at Stanford University found that multitasking is less productive than doing a single task at a time. The researchers also found that people who regu are regularly bombarded with several streams of electronic in information, this is inf interesting, cannot pay attention, recall information, or switch from one job to another, as well as those who complete one task at a time. And this was an article by Travis Bradbury, who interestingly enough wrote the book Emotional Intelligence 2.0. And the implications are that technology then multitasking, and particularly, dulls our senses of emotional intelligence. So in short, emotional intelligence is a terrible strategy for productivity. And yet, so, somehow we think that multitasking is this virtue. It was interesting because my wife, Carolyn, who is here, um, we were watching the Olympics last night, and we were watching the men's downhill. Anybody watch the men's downhill? Okay, the Norwegians took first and second. And they made this comment last night on TV. It's, it says, the Norwegians, when they eat together, put down their phones. It's not, it's about team, not about social media. I thought it was really an interesting comment on the Olympics and on the productivity and the victory that the Norwegians won. Uh, this leads into my concern about what, the, what technology is doing to family and family communication. I'm sure you've all been to restaurants, okay? And you've seen people on their phone. I'll guarantee you they aren't looking at the menu for the restaurant. They're doing something else. And uh, there, there was an article that came out in the New York Times uh, a little while ago, and these restaurant owners were having real difficulty <coughs> because their, their servers were going up trying to take the orders of people. They were on their phones. They hadn't looked at the menu. So service was slowing down. But as, they couldn't say anything about the cell phone use because if they did, then as soon as the people got outside, they'd get on Yelp or one of these other things and bash the restaurant, you know, for talking about cell phones. Although what they did is these same people got out, got on Yelp, and bashed them about slow service. <laughs> <laughs> so these restaurateurs are saying, what do we do about this technology? Well, what's more uh, disturbing to that than me, to me than that about about restaurants is going in and seeing a family of four or five and everybody's on their technology and they're not talking to each other. We see this in the dining, in our diner all the time. There'll be 
four or five people not talking. I saw this in the hallway as I was going to class last week. Um, so I have 30 people in my intro to the social class and probably 10 of them were out in the hallway. Every single person was looking down at their screen. Nobody was talking. So uh, the other thing that's really disturbing, so in the restaurant you're there and I've actually seen uh, couples, parents, give the phone to a kid so they would be quiet. Hmm. So they wouldn't have to interact with each other. So, you know, I know traditionally dinner time was when we sat around the table and we, anybody watch Blue Bloods? I love the dinner scenes of Blue Bloods, you know, when they're all sitting around and talking. You know, that's kind of the traditional thing of what dinners would be. Dinners aren't like that anymore. Family nights after dinner aren't like that anymore. Mom and dad go to their computers, kids get on their tablets or their phones, and, and they don't talk to each other. I saw an ad um, last year for, and I asked my wife what these are called. I'm going to call them baby walkers. You know, they're in a circle and you put the baby in them and they have a tray and the babies can scoot around on them. But what it, this baby walker had a stand that came up like this right in front of the baby with a place to put the computer pad in. <laughs> okay. And so these, these were hot items, selling items, because the parent then could put the put the tablet in, the kid could get fixed and sit on the tablet, and then parents haven't had to watch the kids. There were several, there have been several incidents of, of babies being harmed or even dying because moms or dads were on the internet or on the phone or something and not paying attention to their kids. 2014, the Boston Medical School uh, did a study of 55 parents in interacting with the kids. They found 40 of the parents used mobile devices during meals and many more were absorbed in the uh, in the device, were more absorbed in the device than in the kids. Another study, which some of my students in a class last semester unearthed, was about drones. Okay, and it was a survey of parents, millennial parents, about drones. Fifty percent of those parents said that they were in favor of drones following their kids to school and back all the time. One out of two parents said they're okay. And so what's happening is the world is being redefined as more dangerous than it really is. Think about it. When I ask my students to turn off their cell phones, and I do, I have a very strict cell phone policy. I have powered off classrooms. But uh, I'll inevitably getting one person say, every class, say, what if it's an emergency? <laughs> And my response to that is define emergency. And they're, they're dumbfounded. <laughs> because everything is an emergency. We redefined, partly because of technology, how unsafe our world it is, and then we have to be connected to this technology. Um, I hear complaints of my from my students all the time about their parents wanting to police their phones, wanting to know what's on the phone. So it's on, on both parts. The big problem here, as I'm seeing this revealed, is that parents are as addicted to their technology as their children are. So this has me thinking about relationships, romantic relationships, to be specific. Um, I cannot tell you how many students confide in me that they just broke up with their boyfriend or girlfriend via text, <laughs> okay, or email. And, and that seems to be, again, that safety. Uh, online dating has presented opportunities to, for people, there's not a whole lot, I mean, you guys are pretty representative of the population in Prescott. There's not a whole lot of opportunities for a lot of young people here to meet other young people. Okay, so online dating is an opportunity. But it's also an obstacle. Because on the internet, we tend to put together, put out there, and put together a profile of our fantasy self, <laughs> our ideal self, to be kinder, the thing we want the world to see. And uh, when they seem a person that could be a little bit disappointed. There's an interesting. Uh, thing about relationships. When you first meet 
each other your individuals. But as you get to know each other and get romantically involved, you can spend more and more time with each other, more and more communication with each other, until at some point you're connected at the hip. We all know how that goes, okay? And then in a healthy relationship, what happens is that you grow apart while staying connected to each other. So it's kind of an hourglass shape in the relationship. What technology is doing is it brings people closer together faster because you're texting every day, maybe every hour. What are you doing? How are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And they come up and they don't disconnect and they don't individuate. So they, they get lost. They lose their own identity in the relationship. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about school and what technology is doing to, to schools, and particularly for instruction. There's a lot of pressure on teachers now to perform and entertain rather than teach. Because technology has, has stimulated us and students get bored, and I'm putting that in quote, uh, very easily. So there's a lot of pressure to do this. An another problem that we're facing is the internet has made plagiarism and copying and cheating really easy. Really easy. We even have software programs called SafeAssign or TurnItIn.com where we, where we turn those in. And there are companies out there who are making money seeing if anybody stole stuff. But, but the biggest, the, a couple of things. One of the things is when the students, this is kind of humorous, when they copy stuff off the internet and paste it and the font's different and the type's different. <laughs> and, and every, you know, like, okay, you know, I'm dumb, but not that dumb. Um, my favorite one was one semester, I was grading papers and I read this paper and I said, oh, it's pretty good. About three or four papers later, I'm reading this paper and I'm like, this is deja vu. I think I've read this paper before. Okay, so I took these papers, put them together, held them up to the light, and the only thing that was different about these two papers was the name at the top. Okay. What happened in this incident is one student said to the other student, well, I don't understand how to do the assignment. So this other student naively emailed the assignment to the questioning student, and this student, unbeknownst to the first student, simply changed the name and turned it in. Same class. Okay. So, um, so this has made things a little bit more difficult in teaching because the goal now, because technology, think of technology. What technology does is it promotes efficiency, right? Do things as quickly as you can in nanoseconds sometimes, okay? But it doesn't, um, it doesn't push the idea of effectiveness. In, in the school setting of learning. It's not about learning, it's about getting the assignment done. Okay? And so, um, what happens is students go to the internet and they find the first thing that pops up, up on Google because the assumption is the first thing that pops up on Google is the most important or the truest thing. <laughs> Does anybody know why when you do a, a Google search or an internet search, the first thing that pops up, pops up? Yeah, the company pays for it. Exactly. They, they pay more than the other guys. It's called internet optimization. <laughs> and people pay big money so their sites pop up to the top. It has nothing to do with how often the site is visited. It has nothing to do with how true the site is. And, and so this pops up and students find it. So one of our big tasks now in teaching is helping students find credible resources. And I'm not against students going on the internet and looking for stuff. There's some great stuff on the internet, but you gotta know what's junk and what's not. Okay, so in my social problems class, I start out the class by showing the film Aaron Brockovich. I don't know if any of you remember that, uh, the Hinkley PG&E uh, utility company in Hinkley near Barstow, California. Uh, there was water poisoning, people got sick. Lawsuit, biggest uh, lawsuit, $330 million settlement for the for the people in Hinckley. And so we talked about hexavalent chromium and water pollution. And we talked about Flint, Michigan that happened last year and the lead in the water. And we talk about the arsenic in our water here. By the way, the EPA says that 
10 parts per million is is for arsenic here. We're about 9.7 in Prescott. I just don't want to scare you, but that's what we are. Um, and then I have them go on a website uh, called dhmo.org, dihydrogen monoxide. Okay, and this website gives all the facts about dihydrogen monoxide. Is that it's in almost all of our the things we eat or drink. Um, if ingested, it could kill you. Okay. Um, it has a terrible environmental in, impact, etc. Anybody know what DHMO is? Water. Water. Yeah. Water. Every semester, 100% of my students are totally duped. They are ready to write letters to their congressman to ban <laughs> dihydrogen monoxide. <laughs> okay. And they say, oh, I feel so stupid. That's the point. The point is that you have to check out the credibility of sources. And so, in learning in general, the internet is posing and technology is posing problems that we never had to deal with before in education. Uh, so what about online degrees? This is a very controversial, and I hope I don't offend anybody intentionally. I'm not doing it intentionally if you have an online degree. Uh, several years ago, uh, I'm in the social sciences department, so we were interviewing a psychology, prospective psychology professor. Okay, they had gotten their bachelor's degree at an online school, which I won't name, and their master's degree at an online school. And so we were asking them questions. The interview seemed to go well. And then one of our uh, panelists says, um, who's, your, who's your favorite psychologist? Who do, who do you follow and track with the most? And there was silence. And there was more silence. And there was more silence, and so I kind of repeat the question. Okay, well, who's your favorite psychologist? Who are you drawn to? And she says, to be honest, I can't remember. This is a person with a master's degree in psychology who's applying for a teaching job and can't think of a name of a psychologist. Hello, Sigmund Freud, just say Freud, <laughs> okay? But, but uh, employers now are, are really taking a look at online degrees because again it's become about efficiency not effectiveness um, there's a one of our one of my colleagues is a PhD student and we were talking last week and she was sharing ideas about a research project and she says well what research method do you think I should use and I we talked a little bit more and I said I think you ought to do mixed methods some quantitative and some qualitative and she says oh they won't let me do that at, at this school, this online school, which I won't name, but it's another school. Um, and I said, what do you mean? They said, well, they said it's too hard. <laughs> and I'm like, you're a PhD student. If it's too hard for you, who's going to do it? 9% <laughs> of our students say they prefer online courses, but almost 40% of our courses here at Yavapai College are online. Now there's some legitimate reasons students take online courses. You know, they, they've got kids at home, they have transportation issues, they live out of the area, agree, okay? But we have students in dorm taking their full load full time, although we are addressing that this next coming semester. Um, I interviewed another student about online classes here at the college, and I'm not bashing the college, we have some great online classes. In fact, Curtis Kleinman back here is one of our best online professors. He uh, teaches Spanish, and if you can do Spanish online, you're pretty good, and he's pretty good. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, but, uh, so I was interviewing this one student. He says, oh yes, I took this course, and I waited till the day before. I opened up the course, in 16 hours, I took this course, because you could take the quizzes as many times as you wanted to until you passed. And he took the class, he said, it took me 16 hours to go through the course, and I got to be in the course. And I said, what did you learn? He says, I don't know, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, again, the, the problem's here. Um, I'm concerned about our over-dependence on technology in the class. I mean, we have great things. With it. Any of you familiar with TED Talks? Mm -hmm. I use a lot of TED Talks in my class. So we've got some great resources. But I'm concerned that we have relied too much on technology. 
and that technology actually becomes a distraction for our students in their own learning. I had this conversation just last week in preparation for this with a class. And I said, what about Canvas, which is our learning management system? All our courses on Canvas, the readings, assignments are on Canvas. And I said, is that a distraction to your learning? And they said, well, not exact, yeah. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, well, Canvas is fine. We like the way it's organized and we have all the resources there. We can see our grades. But they said, whenever we're on Canvas, we have Facebook open, we have um, other social media sites open, we have the internet open, uh, we have our email open, and so we're never really concentrating on our courses. We're going back and forth between these different tabs. And I wonder, just personally, if that's not causing more distraction. Research has been done on how long it takes for us when we're doing one task to shift to another task and back to that task, okay, to refocus on the task. And the research says it takes from a few minutes to up to an hour for our brain to totally engage. So if you're switching between four or five tabs on your computer and trying to do your homework, it's probably not going to be real effective. Linda Stone, who was a former Microsoft employee, interestingly enough, coined the phrase continual partial attention. Think about that, continual partial attention is that we're paying part of our attention to everything all the time. So we're not focusing on anything. And she made this statement, she says, we're motivated to do this because we want to be a live node in the network. And I thought, whoa, what does that mean, live? It's because we want to be where all these other signals are coming in and we don't want to be left out. Continual partial attention. Cornell University did a study where they took classes and they allowed half the class to, to use their laptops. And half the class, they says, don't use your laptops. Well, I'll guarantee you that when they're on their laptops, they're just not taking notes. However, when they do take notes, they don't tend to take notes. They tend to try to transcribe the professor's lecture word for word, okay? What that study found is that students with laptops open showed significant memory gaps in the material that was presented. And so instead of just paying attention and being involved in the conversation, then the distraction actually caused them to learn less. Lastly, I want to talk about health. Despite Fitbits, I don't know how many of you are wearing, I know at least one person is wearing a Fitbit here. Um, <laughs> but despite Fitbits, uh, we haven't seen a, a real drastic decrease in health disease, obesity, that kind of thing, uh, because of technology. Well, let's take driving. We are one of three states that have no legislation against texting and driving. 23% of the students I surveyed says, yes, I text when I drive. Watch it when you go out of the parking lot, because that means one out of four drivers is not going to be looking up. I'm just warning you, OK? Um, there is a Senate bill right now on the floor of the House, 1261. Here is the impact it would have. This kind of blew me away. It would impose a fine of between $25 and $99 for the first offense and between $100 and $200 for subsequent offenses. For $25, I'll stay on my phone, right? If texting while driving causes serious injury or death of another person, the defendant will be charged with a class two misdemeanor and receive a fine up to $4,000. That's the bill that's on the House floor now in Arizona about texting. Why we want to kill ourselves, I have no idea. <laughs> Sleep deprivation is a huge issue. 34% of the students I surveyed says they slept with their phones on, in their bed, and they didn't get a full night's sleep. One out of three students. And don't get me started on sleep, because sleep is the biggest enemy of success, whether you're in college, you're in business, whatever. Um, the average, our average students get about 6.7 hours of sleep a night. To be functional as a college student, you need between, between 9 and 10 hours of sleep, because at night, that's when your brain consolidates memories. That's where all the money you've paid to go to class really pays off when you're sleeping. 
but our students have, haven't figured that out yet. Um, there, there was an article, a study they did about business people and phones. And so they, they studied people who did work on their tablets or their phones at night before they went to bed versus business people who didn't. And they found out those who tried to cram that work in at the last minute actually were less productive than people who didn't do work on their computers and their phones before they went to bed. Okay, again, it stimulates the brain. I don't know if you're familiar with blue light and red light. Mm -hmm. In the morning, when the sun comes up, it emits blue light. The blue light is what tells our brains, wake up, it's morning, it's time to get going. As the day goes on, the, the rays of the sunlight go toward the more red and orange of the spectrum. Okay, and that tells our body, oh, wind down, it's time to go to sleep. Okay, these are called circadian rhythms. Okay, and, and it's the sunlight that actually communicates to our brain. That's the way we're hardwired. Guess what kind of light your phones and your tablets and your computers put off? Blue, Blue light. So if you look at your computer or your phone or your tablet at night, then it's telling your brain, wake up, wake up, it's time to wake up. And even if you do go to sleep, the quality of your sleep they've measured is not the same as when you, when you fall asleep with the red light. Now there are some phones, and I, I, I bring this up to my students, they said, well there's a setting on my phone that says it gives me red light. Okay? Well, it's, what it is is less blue light. <laughs> it's not red light, it's, it's less blue light. Uh, so sleep is a huge issue. Uh, or issue that really concerns me about our students. Um, social media. In this study I did, I had a student that wrote this on the survey. I don't want to be on social media, but if you aren't, you're a nobody. And so there are real identity issues, which I don't have time to really talk about. There's real identity issues here. Social media basic, basically discourages authenticity. It discourages us showing up the way we really are. And just as a side note, if I see one more picture of a slice of pizza or a salad on Facebook, I'm gonna scream. <laughs> okay. One of the biggest things that happens is that our, our tethered, and Sherry Turkle talks about being tethered to technology, it does, is that it impairs our ability to um, enjoy or engage in solitude. And now why is that such a big deal? Because we know from brain science that solitude is the birthplace of creativity, ingenuity, calm, peace, well-being. Periods of solitude. Um, uh, the author of, of The End of Absence, Michael Harris, which I'm going to read you a quote for you in a minute, says, we're so overstimulated that being alone has become unbearable. Uh, uh, this is from another study, I'm sorry. A fact that was highlighted in a series of studies from 2014, this is amazing, where people preferred to give themselves electric shocks rather than being in a room alone for six to 15 minutes. Okay, they said you could be alone or you could shock yourself. <laughs> and the majority of the people decided to shock themselves because they couldn't stand being alone in a room for 15 minutes. Okay, that's how bad it's gotten. Um, which all this kind of boils down to what one of the articles I showed you was talking about it when they talked about addiction. And there's a big controversy. Is addiction the right term? Is that what's really going on? Is it whatever? Personally, I don't care what term you use. You can call it addiction, you can call it overdependence, you can call it tethered, I don't care what you call it. But, it. but it's this connection we have to technology where we feel insecure without it. Um, just in January 18th, or January 18, two, uh, 2018, January 8th, Apple shareholders, these are people with stock in Apple, wrote a letter, an open letter, to the execs, says we need to do something about the addictive properties of the products that we're selling because they're destroying our children. These are people who own stock in Apple that are writing this letter. 
It says Apple has been told to take urgent action to curb children's smartphone addiction amid fears that technology could be damaged the young generation. Um, psychological addiction by, by social scientists is described something like a repeated habitual activity that interferes with normal activities and productivity. Okay, so I ask my students, 636 Yavapai students, um, would you say you are definitely addicted to your technology? Maybe addicted to your technology or not addicted at all to your technology? 11% said they were definitely addicted to their technology. Another 48% said they were probably addicted to their technology. That's about two-thirds of our students, and if you extrapolate that over our population, that's about 4,500 of our students that they say, say that they have some level of addiction to their technology. That is scary. When they've done brain scans of people on cell phone use, they found that 50 minutes of cell phone use basically send your brain into overdrive. Your brain metabolism goes crazy, and they use functional MRIs to do this. When they compare those brain scans with scans of people on cocaine, they're almost identical. The same brain neuromechanisms that happen with physical addiction happen with cell phone addiction. Is that talking on the cell phone or using the smartphone? Uh, it's just, I don't think it's so much talking, but using the, the computer features on it. Oh, yeah. Um, there is a thing called internet addiction disorder. Mm -hmm. Now, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Mental Illness is the official manual that is used in psychology to determine illnesses. In this latest edition, it was not put in, but the note was that, that it needs to be studied and as a possible, possible addiction. Um, and they noted that it has the same effects as alcohol or, or drug addiction. In Korea, they're a little bit ahead of us, and that's not necessarily a good thing. They have these things called PC bongs, which are basically video game cafes. And they have tons of teenagers that go in there, and there have been multiple reported deaths because these Kids will go in there and they won't eat, they won't drink, they won't sleep, they'll be totally absorbed in the game, they'll just fall dead in these PC bonds. The government of Korea has instated and paid for internet addiction camps. The problem has gotten so bad, they see it as a public mental health crisis and they send children to this with some mixed results. Brent Conrad, a clinical psychologist, says internet addiction, although not an official DSM diagnosis, is often viewed as an impulse control problem similar to pathological gambling. While a gambling addict typically finds the thrill of winning most rewarding, those addicted to the internet are often drawn in by social rewards. It's both a physiological and a psychological addiction. So likes, the number of followers, the number of hearts, thumbs up, those become the currency for social media addiction. Interesting, because one of the questions I ask in my survey and my study of students is, would you get help if it were available? And the most often comment I got back was, where would I go? We have, on campus and in our community, places where you can get help for drug addiction for alcohol addiction, for gambling addiction, for sex addiction, for overeating addiction. But I don't know of any place in our community where you can go for technology addiction. So the big question is, is being tethered to, interdependent on, addicted to, or obsessed with, you choose your term, technology, is that the new normal? Is that the new normal in our society? Found an article, a book by Ben Evans, Beating Life's Four Biggest Addictions. And I asked my wife, I says, what do you think the four biggest addictions are? Here's what he says. Checking email, social network, news updates, and cleaning. I don't have the cleaning, I'll tell you what I got. Okay. Sherry Turkle and Alone Together says, networked. We are together, but so lessened are our expectations of each other that we can feel utterly alone. 
And this really hit me. It's a little sentence it's tucked in her book on page 154. She says, mobile technology has made each of us possible. You've been in conversations where somebody will be talking, somebody will say, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay, what were we saying? <laughs> I just put him on pause. Mm -hmm. And it's made each of us possible. That really got to me. So I've been doing an experiment with my students, and I will show this to you. I found a site called uh, Space Break or Space Breakaway. And what it does is it logs every day how many minutes you're on your phone and how many times your screen is active, how many times you basically logged into your phone. Okay, and I've challenged my students to do this and report their results to me. Well, I was in class Tuesday, and uh, my class was saying, this program's wrong because it cuts us off like after five hours. <laughs> okay? And so we got talking about this and they said, Dr. Shelley, we want to see your phone. Okay, so today I've been on my, I've unlocked my phone four times and I've been on 25 minutes. And they say, how do you do that? <laughs> they say, don't you get a lot of texts and emails? I says, yeah, but I don't have to answer them. And they go, oh. <laughs> So Sherry Turkle wrote a very powerful book. I'd highly recommend it. She, her story's really interesting. She's been doing this for about 30 years. Her first book on technology was very optimistic about what the internet and connected was gonna do for our society. Her last two books over the last two decades have not been quite as optimistic. This one is her latest book called Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talk in a Digital Age. Okay, very, very powerful book. I'd just like to read a a short, short uh, excerpt from it. She says, we are at a crossroads. So many people say they have no time to talk, really talk, but all the time in the world, day and night, to connect. When a moment of boredom arises, we have become accustomed to making it go away by searching for something, sometimes anything, on our phones. The next step is to take the same moment and respond by searching within ourselves. To do this, we have to cultivate the self as a resource, beginning with the capacity for solitude. Mm -hmm. And then Michael Harris, in a, in a marvelous book called The End of Absence, which he claims that those of us who were born probably after 1970, 1975, are the last generation to know what it's ever going to be like to be disconnected from technology. And he says this, just as we decide to limit our intake of the sugars and fats that we were designed to hoard, we now must decide to sometimes keep at bay the connectivity we're hardwired to adore. We must remain as critical of technolog technological progress as we are desirous of it. And we must make these decisions not because we dislike the things we could connect to, but precisely because they're so crucial to our survival. He ends by saying, every technology will alienate you from some part of li your life. That's its job. Your job is to notice. First notice the difference. And then every time, choose. Thank you.